Is this the first time the two of you have done something like this together to discuss the cartoon? Uh, maybe at a bar we have. I mean, I think we've discussed cartoons before. I think we've, uh, uh, as, as fellow cartoonists, and I was cartoon editor, we have discussed the undulating fate of uh, cartoons and cartoonists many times. Yep. Mo mostly to complain about it. Right? I guess I meant this one specifically. On the dog, nobody knows you're an on the internet. Nobody knows you're a dog. I like on the dog. Nobody on knows the dog. You. No one knows you're an internet. That's true. <laughs> well, that, that that's the idea that I've been pitching for years, but nobody's buying. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, Peter and I have had, in a way, similar experiences as being defined by often by a single cartoon that people know. Uh, and so for Peter, Peter's done hundreds of cartoons, wonderful cartoons. I mean, I from a database, I printed some of them out from when Lee Lorenz was uh, uh, art editor and cartoon editor, and I was. But people remember a, a few of your cartoons. And so we both know what's going to cartoon will be in our obituaries. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but Peter, Peter, you've always said that you kind of don't look forward to, although, again, you won't be around to read your obituary, but you have <laughs> said repeatedly that you don't relish the idea of that being the thing for which you will be known in the lead of your obituary. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I've written nine novels now, and, uh, <laughs> and hundreds of cartoons. I was a college teacher. I mean, all those things, they count for me, at least. You know, I like them at least mentioned. But I, I guess I can live with that as a headline. Uh, but and but well, I was I thought there'd be a good business in leaked obituaries. <laughs> you know, I could see where that's uh, that. Well, now you can get. I've had ChatGPT write my obituary, so I sort of know what it's going to be like. The uh, <laughs> well, let's be honest. I've I worked in newspapers for thirty years. Many newspapers already have obituaries pre-written oh, for many. Oh, many oh I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know. The idea is to keep making them change it. <laughs> uh, I think that the uh, uh, the renown of that cartoon, though, does serve. It, it's really an amazing cartoon in that it transcends the New Yorker cartoons. I mean, people will think of great New Yorker cartoons and Charles Adams and Peter Arno, but it's very much tied to the New Yorker. I would think many people know of this cartoon uh, who have no idea that it appeared in the New Yorker. So its reach, I think, is much greater than that. And it's, uh, uh, it's, inf it's, uh, it's resonance in the culture remains. Uh, that's true. You know, <laughs> since we're talking about Peter's other cartoons, you know, when I, I printed out some of his other cartoons, and I think that uh, the, uh, you know, I'm looking at a cartoon from that same year, uh, 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 1993, where it's a Canadian uh, Mountie talking to a patient in bed. Maybe you remember this cartoon, Peter. And uh, he says to the patient at the hospital, we're borrowing the best features of the Canadian system. So the, the as Canadian Mountie. So I think when I'm looking over at Peter's cartoons, other than, I mean, here's another really funny one, another doctor scene where the doctor is saying, we can give you enough medication to alleviate the pain, but not enough to make it fun. And so Peter, it's worthwhile just going over a few of these cartoons. Uh, uh, and you can see all of them on my company, cartoonstock.com, a little plug there for <laughs> For, for, but it's where you can see all of Peter's 500 cartoons. You're, you're shameless, Bob. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I, but I, I feel like I owe it to myself. <laughs> well, Peter, I believe you did 431 for The New Yorker. Is that correct? Is that? A, I have no idea. I mean, that's what I'm told. I, I, I guess that's right. I, I should, have a, should have been a lot more. <laughs> A few for the National Lampoon. Where, where, where else did you? I, I was looking. Your first cartoon was published in the New Yorker in 1979, but you yeah. had submitted to the magazine for for a couple quite of years a while before that, right? Yeah, I think I started out. I got into the Saturday Evening Post first. 
it was already on the way down, so that wasn't as wonderful as it seemed. And then I did some for the Saturday Review and Clarence Brown. Do you remember? Oh, Clarence? I remember him. We both actually yeah. did that. Yeah. That, was, that was Norman right. Cousins' uh, uh, literary magazine, the Saturday right. Review of Literature. Yeah, it was a fine magazine, and he was a nice, nice man and a cartoonist himself. And then I, I think, um, what else did I do? I did the National Enquirer when they were oh, buying wow. cartoons, and they paid more than anybody, including the New Yorker. Really? Wow. Yeah. That, that would have been, that would have been probably during that time about three hundred bucks. Well, at the time, I think they paid. Yeah, maybe I don't know. Maybe, what it was. maybe because I remember when we started out at the New Yorker, we got paid about. If you got it, if you sold, you got paid about two hundred and fifty dollars. Then a yeah. different rate if you were. Yeah. So, but you did cartoons, a few four cartoons for the National Lampoon. Yeah, uh, yeah I did. I, did. I also did some freelance illustration. I did some pretty nice drawings for the Nation magazine. They 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 used my work for a while, and yeah, wherever I could find work, and I did stuff for a little local paper in Georgia where I was living at the time. And I uh, got fired from that job for doing a cartoon about a little local fraud <laughs> that involved the owner of the paper. <laughs> so, yeah. That's one of my, that's, by the way, one of my favorite stories of yours. And it seems like on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog to be very uh, much of its time today. Yeah. Well, I think the best cartoons are, are these cartoons that hold up, you know, over, yeah. you know, uh, Internet Dog is this is its 30th anniversary. But I think I think most of the cartoons, most of the I mean, a few of the cartoons that you've done, I'm sure, like everybody else, played on 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 topical issues. But for the most part, I think the hallmark of a great New Yorker cartoon, maybe a great single panel cartoon is that it's. I wouldn't say timeless. I'm not talking about hundreds of years, but they work within a lifespan of of, of viewers. Yeah, know? yeah, I think so too. I think that's right. If if they still make you laugh after thirty years, that's that's a good sign. It's it's, it's like being married after thirty years if you can still make the person laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because you know. Every 10 years or every 20 years, there was a, a, a revisiting of that particular cartoon. And over the course of the last 30 years, there has been a significant sort of readjustment of how people approach and how people think about and how people discuss this cartoon. Because it was once talked about how it was, in fact, a, the anonymity, you know. So in 93, people talk about how it was impactful because it mainstreamed the phrase the internet in 2003 there was a discussion about how it was true because there was great anonymity on the internet in 2012 there was a discussion about how in fact the internet has become less anonymous and in 2023 we're talking about the fact that this is in it may be more true today than it has been in the last 30 years of its existence so its thinking and its impact has evolved. Have you noticed that? I'm happy I, you explained it to us. Uh, yeah, I, no. I, I haven't paid that much attention to it. <laughs> I, I, think all, I, I, think, uh, um, I think all those things are simultaneously true because they all, they all, they all sort of continue to, I mean, you could look at the cartoon in one way that, uh, in a, in a surveillance state, everybody knows who you are. On the other hand, to combat surveillance, there are all avatars and facades and, you know, layers of disguise. So for uh, uh, the, the uh, you, uh, uh, and it's a strange kind of surveillance where it's a surveillance which, which is a kind of anonymous in a way, but still harmful, right? So in some way, as I'm browsing the internet, Google knows me and is pushing things to me constantly. But that person who knows me and is surveilling me isn't a person at all. I'm being sort of machine surveilled. So. Yeah. 
You know, I had a I had a revelation about this cartoon this morning. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about time. <laughs> I it took a long time. I I um I realized the cartoon is autobiographical and that it's about being an imposter or feeling like an imposter. Uh-huh. And I, I think a lot it of wasn't, it wasn't about the internet at all. It was about my sense that I'm I'm getting away with something. What were you getting away with? Well, being a cartoonist for one thing, you know, and I mean in every every I've had I've had several checkered careers. And in every one, I felt like a bit of a fraud. I mean, that's, you know, I, I think many people have that syndrome, you know, the sense that you don't really, exactly, yeah. That you, every, I've got everybody fooled. They think I know what I'm doing and they think I'm good at this. So I think that's, for me this morning, that was a kind of interesting revelation this late in the game. Well, but, I think, I think when, like Peter, you have a body of work. That body of work is greater than you. Yeah. Uh, and and but when people meet you or they look at you as though you are that body of work embodied, and you know you're not. You know that oh, th this is your aggregate uh, uh, time that you put in. Yeah, it's just stuff you did. That's all. It, it's stuff you did, but that is, you know, it depends like whether you're feeling depressed or good about yourself or whatever. And that's one way to look at it. But that's that's pretty true for everybody, except maybe some polymaths who are actually, you know, Johnny Von Neumann, who was, was everything you thought about him. And in and, and the moment when I think when you you. you but but what you accomplished is is the body of work. I mean, I think Joyce Carol Oates actually shared an inter interesting interview in the Times in which it was very, very frank and honest. And she said, that's what she thought was important, that everything eventually goes away. I mean, right. you go away too. But the interesting, I mean, I, I find that in the work I did when I look at it and I look at the pencil markings and stuff, and there's something about it that was done on typing paper at that time that will survive you and that somebody, I mean, so this we have talked about, Peter, and it's a type of consolation, is that, you know, someone is going to be looking at this. It, it, it mattered. You know, someone will be looking at that cartoon a hundred years hence. It will be talked about. And yeah. you know, it, I, you know, I mean, to use the Woody Allen line, I'd I'd rather uh, I'd rather not be immortal this way. I'd rather be immortal by not dying. But the, but the, but the, but it's uh, it's okay. I mean, I think it's impressive. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, either that or it means nothing at all. <laughs> because the, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, to, to that end, it's interesting because, Peter, you have over the last 30 years done a number of interviews about it. And I got the sense that at least the first 10 or 20 years, you were bemused, maybe even a little annoyed by the fact that there was so much focus on this one particular work. It eluded, it seemed to me, your uh, purview in terms of why people were talking about it, why they kept talking about it, and the myriad meanings they took from it. Has your feeling about it changed over the last 30 years, or the, at least the last 10 years, because it's been a few years since you've done an interview about it. You didn't do a 30th in anniversary piece, but there was many 10 and 20 anniversary pieces. Yeah. Yeah, no, it has changed over time. I mean, I'm I'm a slow learner, but I have actually come to understand that the thing, the cartoon to people, particularly IT people, people in the internet who 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 live and breathe the internet, that it is that it has been an important somehow signal event, this this cartoon in their in their careers and their lives. I mean less Last year, I was approached by a young man who wanted to do an NFT of the cartoon, and uh, he he actually persuaded me that it was the, that the cartoon itself was a valuable kind of almost a, a harbinger of the of the way things were going to go. 
And, um, and so ha having talked to people over time again and again about it, I have come to learn that it's, at least to some people, it's a very important cartoon. To me, it's still, you know, it's still just one of a batch of 12 or 15 that I sent in and didn't expect to sell. I thought there was one in the batch that was much better than that. I don't remember what it is, of course, but, you know, and and when it came, came back with a little O on it, which is how Lee would signal that it was it was accepted, I, would, I was delighted, but a little bit baffled, and I did the drawing and sent it back in. So, well, I think what's interesting when you look at that is that overwhelmingly, the odds are that that never gets published, and, right. and, and, and this never happens because when Lee or I, whatever, when we, there, were thou, there was well over a thousand cartoons coming in. So Lee looked through all of those. Now let's also understand how that decision was made. Lee Lorenz there was the art editor at the time, both, maybe I think so, but till then the cartoon editor did the covers and everything. Lee would make the, he would look, when you went in to see him, uh, he would look through and, uh, at your batch and he would hold a few, or you would mail them in, and he would hold a few. Then he would take probably 50 or so, 60, to William Sean. William Sean then, so here's Lee, who is older than Peter, uh, but somehow connects to this idea of the internet. Here's William Sean, who at that time might be 80, okay? <laughs> and and the idea that somehow, uh, I would think that Lee is sort of explaining to Sean, who is the editor, what, what this is even about. Uh, and, and and I would think that maybe Sean didn't get it or understand it. Um, the uh, uh, So it's interesting how people got it or understood it before they had any connection with the internet. Well, maybe they thought of it as a drawing about the feeling of being an imposter. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's yes. it's conceivable, I, I, right? I guess I I don't. It, there wasn't at that 1993. There's no graphical user interface. There's no mosaic, isn't it? Right. Netscape, Netscape browser. Is it was Netscape. Most, for most people, it's still AOL. Right, uh, but are they yeah, doing anything? It, 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 it's it's calling on your modem, and yeah. so, I mean, it's a uh, yeah. It would be a close run thing of this thing never actually getting public. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Well, that's true of all cartoons, isn't it? I mean, Lee and you, Bob. I presume you have about two seconds to decide whether you're going to hold this cartoon or not, because you are looking at that. Two seconds to make the wrong decision. Right. And, and the, well, because but to I, make the right ones too. Yeah, the right ones also. And it definitely is a gut feeling that we right. have that what we saw in Peter and what I saw in other people is honestly, you know, a voice. And one, one way I can contrast it very strongly is with the, let's say, the cartoon caption contest, which I'm a fan of and I helped create and whatever. But there you just have a gag that's just, in space with no personality, no voice. The New Yorker during those years when Lee was there, and I hope when I was here, got to see sort of how Peter thought within this space. And there is a real consistency in the, you know, when you look at all the cartoons that, that you did, Peter, that almost all of them have, there's a joke, but there's a subtext right. in which the joke is expressed, okay? Yeah. There's an idea which is expressed as a joke. It's not just a joke in and of itself. Right. And I think that adds to, that adds to the relevance for all the cartoons you do, which people still do reprint and appear in textbooks. And, you know, that's the, uh, 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 you know, the, the, this cartoon that you did from 1990, three years before, it's a one dog saying to another, it's always sit, stay, heal, never think, innovate, be yourself. Okay, yeah. so that that cartoon continues to be popular, continues yeah, to show yeah. up in textbooks and all yeah. of that because there is a subtext, there's a meaning. It's not really about two dogs at, at all. It's about the 
it's about, and Peter could explain, it's about what our position, what our slot becomes in an organization and in a place. Yeah. Is it possible that Mr. Sean liked the cartoon because he just liked dogs? <laughs> it's believable. I mean, people. Well, I mean, it, 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 it never would have appeared if there was a snake in the cartoon because no cartoons with snakes would appear during Sean's reign. Right. He had a snake phobia. I mean, he was a pretty strange guy. He was. Yeah. A, I mean, I I was there for many years. You know, where I'd go in and I only saw him once, and. And so he would be there. He had a separate elevator, you know. And uh, so it, it was, I mean, it was an, it, you have that interesting story, uh, you know, which you've told a few times, Peter, but your position at a cartoonist in the New Yorker, even after you had been accepted, was one at very much of an arm's length. Certainly. In, you know, in which in which you were grateful that there were being you really didn't question like, oh, uh, by the way, you haven't bought any of my cartoons in two months, and I'm starving. Like you're not allowed to say that, you know. <laughs> although your spouse would say, really, you should ask. You know, <laughs> you felt like there was a code of silence that somehow right. you weren't allowed to ask. Uh, Mick Stevens, a great cartoonist. Uh, uh, once did ask Lee Lorenz, you know, I haven't sold in a while here. And Lee said, it's hard to sell here. Okay, so that was like all you got. <laughs> That's right. So, and Peter, what's your story? And before you, before Peter did break in, you did write a letter to Lee, remember? That's yeah, I had been sending cartoons for months. I don't know how long. Um, first of all, let me say, this is really an insane way to try to make a living. I mean, you have to be nuts, you know, to send a cartoon month after month. But I did. I was somehow determined to get in, and I'd been sending them in to, to Lee, and uh, I hadn't heard anything. So I finally, it took me months to get up the courage to write this little note. I think it was probably two sentences saying, I've been sending you cartoons for over a year now, and I haven't sold one yet. Could you tell me why? And he wrote back. In his handwriting, he wrote, Dear Peter, your cartoons are a little too, and I couldn't read the word. He had a very terrible handwriting. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's a good story, but it was a horrible feeling. You know, That's and like, I, as you can imagine, I was like a Talmudic scholar, you know, sort of turning this letter every which way, <laughs> trying to figure out what the hell the word could be. It, it turned out the word was broad, and I think I didn't, even when I found out, I wasn't quite sure what it meant, but it, it just meant they were, it was too comic booky, I think. And they did, I did calm down. I mean, everybody starts drawing it in a way that they yeah. end up. Yeah, David Cypress never made it into the magazine, Lee, and I told him why. I said, you, you're, you're, those noses were so big. <laughs> in your early cartoons it was a kind of european <laughs> over uh, you know over trying to somehow make it funny through uh, the the drawing itself rather than through the idea and only a few people could do that well i mean george booth did it magnificently but naturally there wasn't anything he was doing that was just the way he drew yeah, yeah. It was, funny, but when you try to make it funny by mugging or that, that was sort of antithetical to the right, New York. I, I think that's what I was doing also in those early pieces. Well, so Peter, when Lee tells you that you're too broad after you finally decipher the word, how do you then fine tune what you're doing to do, as Bob said a moment ago, to provide this text and the subtext and have to do it in such a split second way that Bob or Lee or whoever makes that decision, Mr. Sean, uh, yeah. David Rennick, any point says, yes, that's the thing. Because that's an remarkably skillful, I mean, I, 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 as someone who wrote, who writes professionally, to be able to do that is the hardest thing in the world, but to do what you do is a thousand times harder because you have well, to it was, hit it. it. It's exactly the same thing as writing. I mean, I found out when I started, started writing novels that 
I was being, I was trying too hard, you know, and the effort showed and nobody wants to see the effort. They want it, they want it to feel easy and, and, and to be easy to swallow and not, you know, not come, come at them too much. That's my sense. So uh, I think when I, when I finally learned, figured out, I think when I figured out what the word was, I'd already kind of corrected, but it was to take out the, uh, take out the devices, you know, the things that I was doing to attract attention or to make the cart, to force the cartoon to be funny. I think that, I think the subtext was always there. I think the ideas were always good. They bought ideas. I sold a lot of ideas before I sold the cartoon. Charles Adams did some of my best ideas. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That's that's an interest. Yeah, the the uh, uh, at that time, uh, you know, when you look at the history of the New Yorker, the idea of the single cartoonist doing everything was not the majority way in which the cartoons were created. There was often. I think during the, certainly the thirties and the forties, Jim Garrity, who was the art editor, cartoon editor, maybe the first one that really makes sense there, did most of Peter Arno's jokes, ideas. It wasn't that, it wasn't that, it was Peter Arno was setting the sort of the sitcom for which could be written. And that was certainly true of Charles Adams that you, and it's obvious by the fact that you have Adam's family movies and TV shows. Uh, uh, But uh, even so during the seventies, they were, they were buying ideas because the, 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 the arc of someone's career often is that they sort of run out of ideas. Yeah. But they can still, but their brand is still there. Uh, And, uh, it was also an, an encouragement, I think, or at least seen partly that yeah. way. It, these guys, it's a way of telling you we're interested enough in your work that you should keep sending it. I didn't realize that at the time, but I think that was part of the message. The New Yorker always gave out mixed messages. So it wasn't well, the, the, everything about the New Yorker was very much a subtext that you had yeah. to decipher about, yeah. about, yeah. about, about what... Uh, you know, uh, what was doing rather than, and that was really the way in which, uh, I think Lee taught by example, really, that you got from dealing with Lee, who was a great guy, you sort of understood, first of all, I think, and most importantly, is that he cared right. about the cartoons. It wasn't simply, hey, we've got to fill a space and this is my job. And he was really a great gentleman. He was very polite. He and he was, was a great artist. I mean, the other thing was that he that he could draw circles around almost anyone doing the work. So his background was in painting and fine arts, I think, yeah. from where he was. And but it's interesting. He was a great artist, but he wasn't looking for great artists. He was looking, I think, uh, as part of the philosophy of that time when he took over, you know, so it's 1972 when he takes over this. Already, Sean has been looking for a singer-songwriter model, someone who authentically creates the entire thing so that that, that, that person's uh, persona through, shown through the cartoons is part of the subtext. That would be the clearest with someone like Roz Chass, right? Clear that 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 it's only Roz who can do Roz's cartoons right. and it's a package deal that you see. But in some way, I think that was true of that generation that came in, whether it's Jack Ziegler or Michael Maslin or even Arnie Lennon, Mick, Levin, Mick Stevens, Peter, myself, we all came in in that generation. And what they were saying is that, you know what, we can, we're more interested in the, in, in the persona, the personalities expressed through the cartoon than the absolute highest level of artistic skill. Because the, the highest level of that kind of skill, you saw really, I would say in the forties, 
You know, if you right. look if you looked at that, these are big set pieces by you know Peter Arno or Whitney Darrow uh, or you know then you know Lee uh, George Price. I mean, George Price is an interesting example. He did none of his ideas, none of those ideas except one uh, cover for the New Yorker of all, all of these sort of bedraggled Santa Clauses, some of them very thin on a subway train. It's a wonderful drawing, but all of the rest were ideas that were supplied. So you don't really, uh, you don't, you, 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 you sort of split the difference in a way. You wanted more personality, more authenticity, which was part of the 60s, part of the 70s. And, uh, you know, I think that still continues today. All right, same thing with comedy, really. You know, you look at a Bob Hope or someone who's saying somebody else's lines. That's what a comedian is in the 40s. Uh, Stand-up uh, has, has evolved in a similar way. Well, you both came in at the late 70s. Did you both think of yourselves as having a particular persona? Did you look at your work and think that's mine? Or did you, I mean, did, did you think that others would look at your work and realize it, based on that singer songwriter model that you talk about, which I think is really, really a, a terrific way to put it. Do you think that, the, do the two of you think that when people looked at your work, they knew who it was without looking at who had signed it? Well, I sort of made sure of it because I had a weird style of dots. So it was like I made sure that they knew it was my work in a way, in a gimmicky way, but in a way actually that came organically of just my obsession with it, with a kind of drawing. Right. I don't think originally I thought that. Originally what I thought is we were all out on a hunt to find an idea before the other person. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very male in a way like I'm oh you know you, you really thought oh I am happy I found that idea before the other guy did the, uh, the uh, because some of the ideas were like that it was almost it was a twist on a particular trope that you thought oh that's it you know this is someone else could get that idea that that some of these uh tropes uh were fungible in a way. It could be one thing or another. Someone could come up with that idea. And, and that's true, you did. Over time, it changed. Over time, as you had to do the, all the work, your, your personality came out. For me, originally, I, I was completely entranced with captionless cartoons and with Saul Steinberg, I really wanted that. And at one point, Lee said to me when I was handing in stuff, you know, Saul Steinberg has already done this, <laughs> you know? So that's, his, he came pretty explicit, but it, be, but I wanted, I wanted it to be, I, the New Yorker was like the Harvard of cartooning. I wanted it to be intelligent, intellectual. That was something that was transcended just a joke. So I think that's how I thought of myself eventually. And I mean, to some extent, I think I realized that all Peter's cartoons are idea cartoons. So, which I think is clear. Yeah, I think I, I think I recognized that I had eventually recognized that I had my own drawing style, the style that could be identified easily as me. But I, I don't think I recognized and my sort of thinking style. You know that the that the cartoon. This or that cartoon was particularly a Steiner cartoon, and I think, I think the, the cartoon editors Lee and Bob recognized it before I did, and I still, I mean, if I had had a better sense of what a Steiner cartoon was, I would have sold a lot more. <laughs> you know, I was doing cartoons that were Mankoff cartoons and Mick Stevens cartoons and Jack Ziegler cartoons. No, but I don't think when you look at the work, when you look at the work, you really see that. I, for instance, I think this cartoon is the, the the policeman on the beach from 1998, talking to the guy who's reading. He says, I, "I'm sorry, sir, but uh, Dostoevsky is not considered summer reading." See, right. That's a I, good I, your kind of cartoon rather than than you know although you know it's conceived the cartoon would work i think but it comes out i think as your background as a writer your, your yeah, that's, background that's, in literature yeah that's what i'm saying i mean i you whoever bought that cartoon they recognize that that somehow belonged to me that kind of thinking I, and i i didn't didn't I still, as I say, I still don't quite know 
what my territory is. <laughs> and I, I guess it's going to stay that way. It's too late to learn now. I don't think learning it helps you. I think it's organic. I think the... Well, you have to... It's, it's, the learning is about yourself, about, you know, it is organic, but it's kind of learning what's going on in there. You know, I, I mean, that's a lifelong journey for all of us, I think, but um, yeah, it's... I think the problem is for most of us, nothing is going on in there. And that's... <laughs> And that's the problem, right? It's like <laughs> it's like you really are. First of all, it's a very easy habit to lose, and it's hard to do. For most of the time, when you're doing creative work, you're not actually creating it <laughs> because you're you're sort of blank. It's like everything else. You're doodling. Right. You're thinking that. You're saying, "Oh, that doesn't work," and then then that. You know, those are like the labor pains of ideas, right? Because it's your unconscious that that is doing it. it well, that is, that is true. But when you when the idea comes, it's it's about the best thing that can happen. You know, yeah, when, absolutely. It, because it know, often just pops in there where where I mean, it's it's or even if you even if you've worked for it, even if it's a even if it's a very difficult delivery, it's a, it's a wonderful moment. Yeah, I think it is. And the difference between I've said between a professional is that a, someone who's a pro at anything that they do creating, a professional for the most part is unhappy with their ideas. Right. The amateur, the a mark of the amateur is they're quite pleased. <laughs> well, to that, you know, to that end, Peter, I always got the sense that one reason you sort of shoved aside or, or were never impressed with the reaction to this particular cartoon on the internet, Nobody Knows You're a Dog, is because as you've talked about repeatedly, it was, it came to you during that period you're talking about here, while you were doodling, while it wasn't any, it, it did not begin as the idea that it became. And that it seems to me that that's sort of the hallmark of really great artists and really great writers is that it is the accidental uh, discovery that you celebrate in the moment, but don't focus on too long because you know it doesn't always happen that way. Yeah, and you know you got to do it again and again and again with cartoons. I mean, one wonderful thing about writing novels, it's like a year-long project. A cartoon is a 20-minute project. And uh, when you get it, time to move on. You know, you can't... Uh, think how wonderful it is. You've got to send in 12 or 15 cartoons. So you have to get back to it. You can't, can't be too celebratory. Bob, I want to ask you real quick, because I know we've been going a while, so I won't keep you guys much longer. But I wanted to ask you. At no, no, we have nothing to do. We're old guys at home. <laughs> really. The limo is not waiting to take me to the after party. Please keep it up. <laughs> I appreciate right. that. <laughs> well, at what point did you begin to realize, oh, geez, this thing is is big? That I know people began to ask for reprints, and I know that it began to show up here and there. And that I think you're more aware of its popularity, at least at the beginning, than Peter was, right? I uh, well, I think where I see it because I become cartoon editor in 1997. At that time, I'm also president of the Cartoon Bank. We're selling that cartoon. People are buying that cartoon. They're putting it in their textbooks. They want prints of it. And you can see just there's an enormous amount of people not only liking it, but shelling out money for it. <laughs> And so that 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 that's the sincerest form of flattery, and your praise, you know, and you and they think it's so it's it's becoming it's in the culture being referenced, obviously. So I don't know how you would do it a Google search for it, but you if you would see one thing Peter said, it pretty soon after it becomes you know reference reference. So I'm sure. Peter, that you, because the Cartoon Bank starts at the New Yorker in 1997, where it's a business, but Grace Darby and the other lady up there, there's a reprint lady. So you would be, before the before that happened, when, whenever someone, someone would request by letter, 
a cartoon, then the, 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 the ladies there, the librarian ladies, would you, they wouldn't tell you about it, but eventually you would get a check. Right. So you must have started getting checks in 93 and 94 and 95 for that cartoon. But when did you hear about, when did you know, for example, that it was became a cultural phenomenon? I knew I, pretty soon. I knew pretty soon because um, Bill Gates wrote a book and he contacted the New Yorker and said he wanted to put the cartoon in. Okay. And um, he paid them. You uh, really should have negotiated that price. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I actually, when they sent me a check for, I think it was like, uh, maybe it was $100. Yeah, $200. I called them up and I said, please, this is Bill Gates. <laughs> and, and they said, well, it's his first book, and our policy is to pay $100 that you to charge $100. That was the New Yorker. That for was the New Yorker. Book. So uh, I knew, I mean, I knew the fact just by the fact that Bill Gates had seen it and wanted it in his book that something was. Well, may, well maybe Bill Gates will see it again. Maybe he'll buy the. <laughs> maybe I can get him bought to buy the NFT. <laughs> Peter. I will tell you, I read a couple of pieces where I believe he actually paid two hundred dollars for the. Oh, is it two hundred? Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, whatever yeah. it was, it wasn't enough. Changed. <laughs> but uh, and that again. I didn't want you to feel shortchanged. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's it, and it continues to be. Uh, yeah, it continues to be very, very popular. And well, now if you if you publish a book about communications, if you publish a book about the internet, if you publish a book about anything related to the internet, if you don't include the cartoon, people think you haven't done your homework. You know, so I think a lot of people publish the cartoon well, yeah, just out of obligation to do it. <laughs> I wonder, like historically, where how. I mean, obviously, there, even in 93, there are other publications. I'm just wondering, historically, the, uh, I mean, in a way, you can look at a whole history of the internet through New Yorker cartoons. Uh, there's, uh, there's a cartoon from the 90s. I try to remember, maybe it's by Sidney Harris, which shows, you know, an information kind of kiosk or at Grand Central, but it's before Google. <laughs> uh, you know, and it has Jeeves and Ask So and So. It has all those search engines that didn't make it. Uh, oh right. Before. Well, there have been there have been at least three cartoons since mine in the New Yorker of two dogs and a computer, referring back to my cartoon. Right, right. I think that I, I think there's a, a, a Cameron Hafiz cartoon. Maybe it's just a flip yeah. on the internet. Everyone knows you're a dog or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it's the same drawing, too. That's a curious thing about it. You know, well, trying to, try to it, set up the same situation. It's, 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 not, it's not a ripoff. It's homage. They say it's an homage. It feels like a ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that should be the title of your, your autobiography. <laughs> they say it's an homage. It seems like a ripoff. That is a good title. I'm right? getting the, the tough side of Peter Stein if people don't know. <laughs> the mean side, right. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have any idea where the original had wound up? No, I didn't. No, they didn't. I don't think they told us, did they? If they did, I didn't pay attention. I just knew somebody had offered the money for it. I don't know how much it was any longer. It was probably five or eight hundred dollars or something. And uh, there were a lot of people that collected New Yorker cartoons. I always assumed it was one of those, but I don't know. I have to tell you, as someone who has devoured the New Yorker since he was a little boy growing up in here, here in Dallas, who read every book about, every history of. I was in journalism for 30 years and I edited a magazine and I always wanted it to be the New Yorker. I edited Chris Ware when we were in college before he oh, started really? doing yeah, before he started doing New Yorker covers. So I've worked with colleagues who have gone on to the New Yorker to get to spend, you know, 45 minutes with the two of you 
Um, Bob, I love the documentary about you. I, I watched it many, many times. Very semi-serious is one of my favorites. I think once is enough, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my wife said. But no, uh, yeah. So yeah, to thank you from my side, and it's great to see uh, Peter. We've known uh, this is. Uh, I think it's a it's a great it's a great uh, it's a great event. It's a great celebration of the form uh, in 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 Peter's cartoon.